On behalf of the New York Wine and Grape Foundation, we welcome you to New York Wines Online. Everything is coming up rosé with Juan Demand. While we wait for everyone to get logged in, we would like to review a few logistical details. If you find yourself with streaming issues, please limit other internet users in your office or household. You may need to close all other open browsers, or you may also find it helpful to log out and log back in with Firefox or Chrome. We have two forms of communication for today's webinar, the chat and the Q&A section. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other attendees. Be sure to select all panelists and attendees in the drop down to field, as it can default to panelists only. Additionally, we have the Q&A section. This is a way for you to ask questions of our on screen panelists. Be sure to enter any questions for the panelists into the separate Q&A section. We will do our best to get to all of the questions. Today's webinar is being recorded and streamed to Facebook Live and will be available to all attendees after the webinar. To begin today's webinar, I would like to introduce Wanda Mann. Wanda is a native New Yorker, certified specialist of wine, society of wine educators, and founder of the wine lifestyle website, Wine with Wanda. She is also a writer and has been doing so for 12 years. Additionally, she is the East Coast editor for the Psalm Journal and New York editor for Tasting Panel Magazine. You can find Wanda on Instagram at Wine Dine Wanda. Wanda, I hand the mic to you. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction and welcome everyone to Everything is Coming Up Rosé. I'm so excited to explore the elegance and diversity of pink wines from the Empire State with all of you. So I'm one of those people, I love rosé all year round, but there is no denying that something about the spring and the summer and these beautiful crisp pink wines, they're just a perfect match. But you know, like everything in New York, our pink wines are different. Uh, they're not quite like anything else. So I'm so excited to introduce you. So tonight we're going to have five winemakers from the Finger Lakes, Long Island, and the Hudson Valley. And they're working with an impressive array of grape varieties, including Pinot Noir, Cabernet Franc, and Limburger to create unique and intriguing rosé wines. So you're going to taste the influence of terroir and also how they each apply different winemaking techniques to craft their special style of rosé. So New York Rosé is here to stay, and let's meet our winemakers. So as I introduce them, they're going to pop on the screen. First up, from Sheldrake Point Winery in the Finger Lakes, I have Dave Breeden, winemaker. From Malaya Estate in the Hudson River region, we have Bruce Tripp, who's partner and winemaker. From Fox Run Vineyards in the Finger Lakes, Peter Bell, winemaker. From Wolfer Estate on Long Island, Roman Roth, partner and winemaker. And Anthony Road Wine Company in the Finger Lakes, we have Peter B. Craft Winemaker. Welcome, gentlemen. How are you? Great. Great, great. great, great. So everyone, please feel free to un unmute yourselves because we want this to be interactive. So as I look at the screen, something is very obvious. All of our winemakers tonight are men, and there's nothing wrong with that. But one of the debates that often happens in wine is this concept of a wine being masculine or feminine. I don't want to get into that debate, but I do want to hear from each of you about your affinity for rosé. Is it something that you've always had? Is it something that came over time in response to consumers? So who wants to jump in? Mm. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> Real men drink rosé. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I grew up in Germany. I started in 80, 1982 making rosé in Baden, which was Badisch Rotgold, which basically by law has to be 51% Pinot Gris and 49% Pinot Noir. So I grew up making rosé and always liked the variety. My brother-in-law got married in Monaco with an Italian lady and lovely woman. And so we made many trips to the Côte d'Azur and had rosé all the time, you know, bouillabaisse and rosé. So grew up, grew up with rosé. And when I came to the Hamptons here in 1992, Christian Wolf I had a welcoming party. It was the weekend of the Hampton Classic and lots of people around the pool, everybody drinking rosé and vodka and all kinds of things. And, you know, 
I said, this is a place for rosé. We have to make rosé. So basically that's where it comes from. So next. I love it. Anyone else have a, a rosé story they want to share how rosé came into their life, their connection with it? Mine is not perhaps quite as compelling as Roman's. That was a good story. But when I came to Sheldrake almost 20 years ago, we had been making dry rosé ever since our very first year here at Sheldrake. And so my contribution was to continue that tradition, change it a little bit, and try and expand it. So it, I didn't come to rosé, rosé came to me. At least you're wearing a pink shirt, I think. That's Thank right. you, right? Yes. That's the one thing I did right today. Well, yeah, the reason I bring it up, it wasn't that long ago, a lovely young man that I worked with about three years ago said to me, hey, Wanda, is it okay for dudes to drink rosé? Rosé is for everyone. Uh -huh. I think we've established that rosé is for everyone. So let's start. There's nothing worse than having these beautiful wines in front of you and waiting to drink them. So you know what? We're going to start with Sheldrake Point Winery. So Dave Breeden will be up first. So I'll give you a little bit of information about Sheldrake Point before we get into the wine. The winery is named for the prominent point of land on which it sits, located on the western shore of Cayuga Lake in the Finger Lakes. It operated as an orchard and dairy farm from 1850 to the mid-1980s. And the 155-acre lakeshore farm lay fallow until 1997, when a small group of wine enthusiasts organized the purchase of the land and founded the winery. So tonight we're having their 2020 Dry Rosé Estate Bottle. So Dave, tell us a little bit about this wine. I see it's 100% Cabernet Franc. Tell us about that choice. That choice was, again, I sort of stumbled into that choice. Our most heavily planted red grape is Cabernet Franc. And when I first started making rosé in earnest, we were doing, you know, 200 cases a year, which is three tons. And we had all this extra Cabernet Franc and we didn't know what to do with it. And sometimes the grapes would get sold. And we thought that maybe there would be a home in the rosé program for the Cabernet Franc. So we switched the rosé to 100% Cabernet Franc and it turns out to be the perfect grape on this site for dry rosé. Um, even when I try and make it a big substantial tannic wine as a red wine, it doesn't work out. It wants to be rosé. It wants to be exactly what this wine is, light and refreshing and actually this is a fairly heavily colored version. That's not always the case. We oftentimes Thank you, Peter. Nice, nice job bottle placement there. Um, we oftentimes tend more toward a Provence level of color, uh, but it very much depends on the vintage. So how was this particular vintage for you? How would you describe this wine that we're tasting? Uh, let me start with the vintage because the vintage was absolutely spectacular. It was, I think the other two Finger Lakes winemakers will agree, it was the best vintage in the Finger Lakes certainly since I've been waking, making wine and really for a considerable period of time. Um, at least on our site, there was enough rain to keep the vines happy. So it wasn't a drought situation. We didn't have to deal with withered berries, um, but there was not enough rain to cause any disease pressure at all. There was no threat of rot, no threat of mildew, no threat of mold. So we could pick the grapes exactly when we wanted to pick them without having to worry about what the weather was going to do to them. And they were right, really right, really early, which is great because I normally harvest into thanks, not into Thanksgiving, but into November. And this year, 2020, we finished middle of October. I got to spend Halloween with my kid. So Wonderful. that's a bonus. So Peter Bell says this is delicious. Thank you, Peter Bell. <laughs> I agree with Peter. I agree with Peter. So why don't you walk us through a little bit for those uh, who want to hear. What am I walking you through? Walk us through, for those who want to hear the wine, make or describe a bit the aromas, the flavors. Oh, got it. Um, so I get sort of uh, candied watermelon, a little bit of cherry on the nose, a little bit of strawberry and cream. And really some of those same flavors on the palate, tending more towards strawberry and cream with some hints of raspberry and cherry thrown in there and lots of acid. Yeah, yeah. Very, very lively, really, really. Right, lively. and that's that's the goal for the thing is to be have it be refreshing. So anything about the winemaking process that you would like to share, um, Sanye method or? 
not Sonia method, um, overnight cold soak. So we pick the grapes either when it's cold, which works every year except 2020 when it never actually got cold, or we pick them when it's warm and get them cold, crush and destem them, and let the skins and the juice sit together overnight. And we want to keep them cold because if they're not cold, they start to do biological things that we don't want them to do. So anyway, we bring them in, get them cold, crush and destem, let them sit overnight and press the next day. I said, someone has a question. Uh, have you been able to make any rosé with your Gamay grapes, Dave? No. Um, and the reason for that is that we don't have enough. Um, the Gamay wine is doing really well as a red wine product. And the people down the hill who run the place would scream at me if I diverted any and put it into rosé. So that's not a thing. Yeah. If you could all stop buying the Gamay, then I could <laughs> turn it into rosé. Someone else was wondering, and you can all chime in here, I think, do outstanding vintages always make outstanding rosés or would it be better with less ripe vintages? Mm, that's a it's good question. I, I, think it, I think it boils down to winemakers taste, really. Um, uh, Dave loved this vintage and so did I, but uh, I think there are some of my colleagues that felt maybe it was too warm. Maybe, maybe the acidity wasn't as fresh as they prefer it. Maybe it wasn't a typical Finger Lakes vintage you know, which is becoming harder and harder to define. So um, uh, a warmer vintage doesn't necessarily, or a great vintage uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to make really tasty wines. And, uh, and sometimes those challenging ones uh, are the ones that, uh, that have a, a really nice character. Um, and uh, if it's a cooler year, maybe that acid is what you're looking for, you know, uh, with these, you know, this wine that, that Dave just made here, uh, and he's a he's a top he's a top uh, rosé maker in the Finger Lakes, you know, following right behind Peter Bell and myself, or maybe right in front of us actually. Um, uh, he's <laughs> he's uh, uh, this this wine has got uh, energy, you know, uh, but it's also got the weight, the weightiness, and um, the uh, impact of flavor. There's a lot of flavor in here, you know. Uh, and super balanced, but it's still crisp and refreshing. So, point is, I think in a hot year that you pick early enough, you have to be ready you know, to be to be able to stop your vacation short and be there to pick. Everybody has overripe tomatoes or you know or over whatever, merely apples. The same is with grapes. If you want the fresh rosé, you have to pick fresh grapes and not overripe grapes. On the other hand, um, I'm going to say that in the in the old days. 25, 30 years ago, we, the, the sort of word on the street was if, if you can't ripen your grapes to make a red wine, you can always make a rosé. And that's completely bogus, right? You can't take underripe green grapes and make a very nice rosé, or you can, but it will smell like jalapenos and nobody really wants to drink them in a glass. Um, so we've gotten beyond the idea that you, you know, pick, pick them very early or make a rosé in a year when you can't ripen your grapes fully. Uh, fully ripe is a very tricky kind of squishy thing to define, but we don't want to take anything to do with substandard fruit and turn it into pink wine. I, yeah, I would completely, for you. Oh, sorry. Wait, no, please go ahead and then we'll go to the next question. But I would completely agree with that. Um, the one thing I would add, and I'm, I'm being horribly provincial here I, because I don't get to taste Romans and Bruce's wines as often as I would like to, but the Finger Lakes, not, not just Sheldrake, but the Finger Lakes as a region over the past five or six years, which have been wild, weird vintages, a lot of them what we would consider terrible, um, has consistently produced high quality rosés. Rosé seems like a thing we can do here. It, year in, year out. We've come far enough viticulturally. We've come far enough, really, we've come far enough viticulturally. It's about being able to grow the grapes even in a bad year. And by and large, the people who do that here have, have figured it out. Great. Well, Dave, two questions came in for you. One is, what is the production on this rosé? How many bottles are, are you making? Um, as many as we can until we run out of grapes. This year, it was about 2,800 cases. Um, we've got additional vineyards coming online next year, and we're hoping to be closer to 3,800. Right. And I'm going to ask all of you this question, so think about it so you're prepared. What is one of your favorite pairings with your, with your rosé? 
it's really hard to go wrong. I mean, there's so many good things with rosé, but yeah, the obvious choices are, are charcuterie, um, uh, grilled shrimp, uh, seafood, any, any, almost anything. So Works I would for leave me. it open. <laughs> works for me. It's also what we call a meditation wine, right? It's just great by itself to enjoy. So that's all good too. <laughs> well, thank you, Dave. If you have any more questions for Dave, put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. But now we're going to move to our next winemaker. And we're going to talk to Bruce Tripp, who's partner winemaker at Malaya State Vineyard. That's in the Hudson River region. Founded in 2015, Malaya Estate Vineyard is located in the heart of one of the oldest wine growing regions in the country, the fertile Hudson Valley, only 80 miles north of New York City. The estate is nestled among the beautiful rolling hills to the east of the Hudson River and surrounded by streams, horse pastures, dairies, orchards, and other vineyards. Sounds quite lovely, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you. And a uh, pleasure to be here with you folks today. Well, thank you for sharing your wine with us today. Yeah, we we have a relatively small production, not nowhere near what uh, Sheldrake Point is doing. Um, but I think this is a, I'm quite happy with this wine. Um, about 60% of this is our estate grown Pinot Noir fruit. Uh, we did add to that some uh, Pinot Noir from out in the, uh, uh, that's the Niagara Escarpment uh, that came from Freedom Run. And we also have a little bit of uh, Pinot Meunier in this wine and just a pinch of Valvin Muscat. Okay, hey, great. So I'm always intrigued when I, you know, Pinot Noir, which we all affectionately call the heartbreak grape. So why yeah. did you opt? <laughs> Because it's very persnickety. We love it, but it's persnickety. Why did you opt to go with Pinot Noir as the, as the dominant grape for your rosé? Well, I just love Pinot Noir. I mean, anything Pinot Noir is, is in my wheelhouse. It's, <laughs> you know, there's wine and then there's Pinot Noir for me. So. And are there some special characteristics you think from Pinot Noir from, from your region? Well, the big thing that we get is, and it, this is true pretty much from all regions, but you get that nice cherry background in the in the flavor. Um, in this case, it's more of a white cherry, but it's there. You also get some nice strawberry notes in this wine. And I'm quite pleased with it. So I'd love to talk about the blend. Um... Have you always added in that Pinot Meunier and then the 5% Valvan Muscat? And what do they bring? What qualities are you looking for? Okay. To add? The, the, uh, the Pinot Meunier, I think, just adds to the complexity of the Pinot characteristics. Um, the Valvan Muscat is sort of a lever for me to add fruit and to add aroma to the wine. So I like to... Sometimes if I want to amp up the, the aroma, which I want to do in almost every wine, sometimes just a pinch of Pinot Noir or of, uh, Valvin Muscat can do that for me. Is anyone else growing Valvin Muscat or ever experimented with it? I have to say, I'm not that familiar with, with the variety. Well, Valvin Muscat is a very aromatic wine. And it, it brings a lot of... Um, fruit uh, complexity to the wines. Again, I'm seeing a nice weight in this wine as well. These are not, these are not watery, wimpy. There's a lot of texture here in this rosé, which is really intriguing. Yep. And Any that from the texture other comes from the, uh, really comes from the overnight soak, mm. similar to what um, uh, Dave had done with his uh, Cab Franc. Uh, Basically, we uh, crush the, we harvest, crush these grapes, let them sit on the skins overnight. Usually that's uh, like in this 2020 year, it was quite warm the day we picked, went right into a cooler and sat crushed and destemmed in that cooler. Great. So Bruce, someone is asking, they're saying, one who's a, who knows your wines well, they're saying that the 2020 vintage is noticeably darker than the 2018. 
Um, is it the composition that, that uh, accounts for this? It may have um, more to do with the, uh, how, you know, the, the, the ripeness of the fruit when it came in. Sometimes you'll get a little better color extract when you're sitting that on the skins. It also is some of it, uh, the portion that came out from the Western part of the state had a little bit more skin contact than the others. But yeah, it comes down to ripeness in my book anyway. Right. Someone is wondering, is Valvin Muscat a hybrid grape or? Valvin Muscat is a hybrid grape. Okay. It's uh, a cross and I'm not sure the hybrid parent, but it's uh, Muscat Ontanel is the uh, vinifera parent. So I'm curious, the Pinot, I'm, I'm guessing that you probably make a, a red from your Pinot Noir as well. Are those sourced from a different part of your vineyard? Do you have a vineyard that's dedicated to the Pinot Noir, a plot for the rosé specifically? Well, right now, our vineyards are very young. Uh, we do have a block that's up in Columbia County. Uh, that's just the next county up. It's probably a 20-minute drive from, um, from our home vineyard. And all of the Pinot Noir from that block was into went into this wine. As a matter of fact, there's a picture of the grapes from that block on the um, that I sent along. It's with two guys standing. Yep, that's it. You can see uh, we're relatively small production here. That's three quarters of a ton of Pinot Noir that we estate harvested. Fantastic. Which is yep, and this is a shot from our tasting room at dusk looking out to the southwest. Very, very nice, very nice. So do you have a favorite pairing? Yes, I, you know, I'm, I'm born and bred in the Hudson Valley. Uh, right now the uh, stripers are running in the river and grilled striped bass in this wine are the thing. Nice, nice. You know what I'm curious about? By a show of hands, um, I think Roman maybe comes from a winemaking family, but were all of you, is wine a new career for all of you? Were you doing something else before? Did you grow up in the wine world? <laughs> Let me, uh, uh, since uh, I'll jump in, um, I've been a uh, environmental engineer for the last uh, 40 years uh, and really been only making wine for the last so oh, about 10 years. Wow, wow. So this is a new career for me. And Dave, what were you doing before wine? I was a graduate student in philosophy working as a chemist. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Roman, I think you maybe you were working in wine before or not? I grew up with the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Peter B. Kraft? Yes. Yeah, I, uh, I came into it from, uh, I was a casting director for a fashion photographer and with a fine arts background. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I bet you've got some stories to tell. I, I do. <laughs> that is a, log it's a logical uh, transition. By the way, Wanda, I like your background noise, the New York sirens. It's really authentic. <laughs> it's <New York>. true. <laughs> I've been a part of Manhattan, everyone. I apologize. <laughs> And Peter Bell, what were you doing before? Uh, I was ca I, w I was agonizing over what career track to take, and I was <laughs> working as a uh, cabinet maker for a oh. few years after getting a useless bachelor's degree in anthropology. I uh, have an anthropology degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Way to go! Yeah, I mean, you're I both in the wine world. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, it's it's the first thing I that came upon me that really gave me this incredibly hard drive and I'm a I'm born and bred in cities so I, I couldn't just go out and work in a neighborhood winery uh, so this was a, a paradigm shift for me my father was a sociology professor and I kind of realized that those guys are really messed up individuals so I didn't want to follow in that track and I uh, broke out and became a winemaker. I love it, I love it. Well, Peter, you're gonna be up next, but Bruce, is there anything else you wanna share about your wine before we go to uh, Peter Bell? No, that's fine. You can, I'll pass the torch to Peter. <laughs> yeah. I just, uh, 
But uh, I love the smokiness of this wine. There's a nice smokiness that the Pinots bring in, and there's a very, Valva Muscat can, um, can overpower in small amounts, and, and, and it was a nice deft touch to just really uh, accentuate, highlight the, the, the aromas. Yes, but I'm gonna agree. Um, the, the assumption is that rosés are kind of straightforward and easy to make. And in fact, that would categorize them as one of the most difficult styles to pull off correctly. And one of the many challenges is to try to, to finesse the blend. We have a couple wines here that have some white wine blended in. And that's a really, really difficult thing to do well. Beecraft nailed it. If you cannot overpower um, a, a wine like this with something that's so perfumey, but this is mm -hmm. right in the background, but it lifts it up really nicely. So great job, Bruce. Thank you, Peter. Great, lovely, lovely. So up next, everyone out there, we're gonna be tasting the Fox Run Vineyards. Uh, 2020 Dry Rosé with Peter Bell. A little bit about Fox Run. Fox Run was a dairy farm for more than a century. It wasn't until 1984 that the first grapes were planted. In 1990, the Fox Run founders transformed the Civil War era dairy barn into a winemaking facility. The estate is composed of 50 acres of east facing vineyards on glacial soils. And again, we are in the Finger Lakes. So Rosé and Finger Lakes are really seeming like a perfect match. So here we're getting into an interesting blend, Peter Bell. 60% Limburger and 40% Pinot Noir. Here we go, yes. Um, and your question probably is gonna be why, why this blend? Yes. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to hark back to Dave Breeden, whose, whose answer, he didn't use the word pragmatic, but it's, it, it is basically pragmatism here. Um, if you were, if you were a number cruncher, you would never nominate Pinot Noir to be part of a rosé because mm -hmm. rosés almost invariably sell for under 20 bucks, um, which is where they should be. But around here, Pinot Noir costs us about... Three thousand dollars a ton to grow uh, because it's such a, a prick, and <laughs> and it's really it's on the one hand stupid to turn it into a pink wine that sells for such little money. The good news is that it makes a really really good pink wine. So I have a couple acres, three acres of Pinot Noir. I decided. 10 or so years ago to stop making it, trying to make it into a red wine because that only works well um, in two or three vintage, two or three years out of a decade. And, you know, Bruce Tripp talked about Pinot Noir as being, you know, one of the ultimate experiences, orgasmic, he didn't use that word, but he, he was thinking about it. Um, experiences with red wine, when you've tasted a bunch of those, they become a benchmark of sorts. When you've made two or three great ones in your life, um, everything else sort of is humbled in, uh, in comparison to those. So it's, it was a pretty easy decision to say, well, from now on, I'm just gonna take my Pinot Noir, it's gonna well-grown, et cetera, but I'm not gonna try to make it into a really sexy red wine. So that, is one thing, Lemberger, let me preface this conversation, it's too late to preface it, but I'm gonna add an addendum. I, I cannot think of a red grape that doesn't make good pink wine. Um, winemakers out there, you can disagree with me, but it's really, really um, hard to find something that is, is like dr dramatically unsuited to making rosé. So, you know, I've made rosé at a Merlot, I've made rosé at a Lember, Cab Franc, Pinot Noir, etc. cetera. Um, I love them all. You have to learn how to work with them. But Lemberger is an easy one. We have a lot of it. Um, it's, it's in high demand as a red wine, but it has really nice dark uh, fruit flavors. Pigments, anthocyanins are really ready to jump into the juice, so not much skin contact necessarily. Necessary. Um, sometimes 
Prussian press, sometimes an hour, sometimes two hours, but rarely any more than that. And if you look after the fermentation, you know, rosé is a winemaking process rather than a grape growing process, I think. Um, you can make a pretty good wine out of both of those. I want to talk about Limburger because it's not that familiar to many people. I know it's also known as Blau Frankish, but in your part of the world in the Finger Lakes, it's Limburger. So why is it called Limburger there? Oh, God. <laughs> and yeah. why did it do so well there? Why, why did you open this can of worms? <laughs> it's a lovely name, Limburger. It is. Um, it, it, we're, we're, we have a 50-50 split somewhat in the Finger Lakes. Um, it was originally when it was planted here in the U.S., mostly uh, you know, on the West Coast, uh, Washington. It was called Lemberger. And then a few people thought, Lemberger, that's a stupid name. Let's call it a neat, an even stupider name because it has an umlaut, um, which is Blau Frankish. And, and um, there's no easy way out of this. But this, the hipster sommeliers in New York um, decided that Blau Frankish was a, a more appealing name because they shortened it to Blau. It, this is oh, insider the Austrian, the Austrian coolness of it. <laughs> of course, yes. In Austria, it became kind of uh, in in vogue. I don't know how to. I don't know how to get out of this little hole we've dug on this. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it's a discussion in itself. But um, let's talk, just give us some of the the general qualities of Limburger for those of us who aren't as familiar with it? Okay, some somewhat easy to grow because it's thick skinned and loose clustered. It doesn't overcrop the way Cab Franc tends to overcrop. Um, there's a few viticulture things you need to do with it, but overall it's pretty easy to grow around here. It doesn't mind very cold winters, uh, so a reliable survivor around here. Um, Mid-season ripener, it ripens mm -hmm a little bit after Pinot Noir, but before the grape, the Bordeaux grapes. So in terms of, again, pragmatism, when you're making a lot of wines and picking a lot of grapes, this one slots in at the right time of year, like early to mid-October. Um, the deer don't eat them. Ah. Raccoons don't eat them. I don't know why. Mm. Um, but <laughs> they'll, they'll go, turkeys gobble up Pinot Noir. Um, and a, few, a lot of other animals love Pinot Noir, but they tend to say no to Lemberger. Maybe it's the name. Yeah. <laughs> so is this the blend? Is this the, your blend that you've been doing for several vintages now, or does it change? It from changes a bit based on volumes and, um, you know, what tastes good. But I, you, you, have to, you have to do an a priori decision about how, how much red or pink wine you're going to make Mm -hmm. Pick the breakdown. You can't take red wine and say, back, you know, go backwards and say I want to turn this into a rosé. So there's yeah. a lot of a, a lot of this um, pragmatic decision making here. That's that's the unsexy answer. Okay. Someone is asking if your wines are available in New York City downstate. They say they can't seem to find Fox Run um, in the New York City. We had a good presence in New York City until COVID happened, and then we couldn't send a rep down there. And um, New York City being somewhat fickle, they that market sort of dried up. Okay. You have to you have to work with New York City clients a lot and be down there because there's so many other people working in that market, and uh, that's just the way it is. So if you don't go down there and do dinners and, and tastings, etc. It's going to dry up a little bit. So we're going to we're going to we're going to get that back. Absolutely. Anyone want to weigh in on on the Fox Run and the Limburger? Any comments at all? I love that wine. I think it's really pretty. It's, I mean, the Limburger can be a sort of bigger grape, and this is sort of light and ethereal and refreshing and gorgeous. Nice. Thanks, Dave. Nice balance of the lingering tannins and the acidity, keeping it fresh. So that's, I think, that's the key in good rosé making is that to balance those, you want the tannins, otherwise it's just some fruit and alcohol. You want some tannin structure, but you want, you know, the freshness and the lightness to go with it. 
Yeah, Roman brings up a very good point. And, and you know, uh, winemakers refer to tannins as phenolics, so, and that's sort of inside insider lingo. So don't be afraid of that term when you encounter it. But it, uh, making good rosé is somewhat a, ma a matter of managing phenolics. Uh, most of us want to make a wine that is not just a white wine with a little bit of pink color, which would be a very low phenolics wine. We want to build some phenolics in to give it some structure to help the taster um, think of something other than a white wine. But on the other hand, we don't want to make it so phenolic that it's like a light red wine. So this is a little dance we do. Right, Roman? It's a balance. Balance. We could only always find it in life. <laughs> oh, we're getting so philosophical. You have philosophers and anthropologists and chemical engineers. This conversation can go in so many directions. So Peter, before we wrap up with you and go to Roman, what is one of your favorite pairings uh, with your rosé? The default would be to say everything, and I agree with what <laughs> Dave Breeden said. Um, that's a little bit of a cop out. I, I tend to tr think of creating a situation where you have all kinds of other sensory input, like being on your back porch or on your in your backyard in the spring or summer with someone you love, and um, having a carafe of this stuff where there's little beads of, of sweat on the outside of the carafe. And these are all kind of cues to make you ramp up your enjoyment. Um, my, my Proustian moment was being outside of Paris a number of years ago and eating a salade niçoise, which is a great food in itself. It's a, a composed salad um, with a carafe of very good Tavel rosé. So I th I'm gonna say, a composed salad, you know, and if you make a salad means well, you've got to get the best potatoes, best anchovies, the very best Boston lettuce. And if you do that properly, that's the food to have with rosé. I love it. You know, and also you mentioned the romance of rosé, enjoying it with someone you love and looking at the stars. So rosé is romantic. There's no denying that. So I'm glad you, you brought that up. So thank you, Peter. So Roman from Wolfer Estate in Long Island. Roman Roth is the partner and winemaker. Founded in 1988, Wolfer Estate Vineyards, unique combination of bridge, Hampton, loam soil, and ocean breezes from the Atlantic, which is only 2.6 miles away, provide Bordeaux-like conditions. They describe their style as European elegance paired with the distinct typicity of Long Island terroir. And we're going to have your state rosé 2020. Now talk about a blend, Roman. We actually couldn't get all of them on the slide. So I'm going to run through it. 44% Merlot, 33% Cabernet Sauvignon, 16.5% Chardonnay, 5.5% Cabernet Franc, 0.5% Riesling, 0.3% Pinot Noir, 0.2% Gewürztraminer. That's seven grape varieties, Roman. <laughs> well, I always say it like this way, if you make a single varietal, and if I would poke you, I'm doing my virtual poking here, it becomes uh -huh. very quickly annoying. And by using a different, a blend of different grape varieties, it's not poking, it is much more balanced, it, it, you don't get the sum of the parts. It is based on the, when you look at Provence rosés, which are based on six, seven different grape varieties. They have these primary varieties that they have to use by law, like Chinso, Grenache, Mourvedre. Uh, they allowed up to 20% of white wine, like Vermentino and Uni Blanc, or Trebbiano and Semio, uh, Claret. So there's all these rules, so secondary varieties, which they're only allowed to add 10%, which is Cap Sauvignon or Carignan. So that's, this has been made for many, many, many years, 50, 60 years in France like this. And when I started making rose here on Long Island, uh, there's a couple of things that are just very unique. It's this very slow and steady ripening curve. And since Corona, we all know what a slow curve should look like. We don't want this ripe, hot climate uh, ripening where all of a sudden you have 16 volume percent. And so we had this long hang time and that, and still 
despite long hang time and great sun influence, we're in the same latitude as Madrid and Naples here. Uh, we can make wines with 11 and a half, 12, 12 and a half volume percent wine. You know, so light and balanced. And that is the key. So hot climates, they have to pick super early if they want to make a light rosé, which means unripe, you know, grassy, you know, sort of Sauvignon Blanc characters type of thing. And in our case, we get this long hang time and still have elegant balanced wine. And that's my goal anyway, to make balanced wines with rosé. I don't do any skin contact whatsoever. I, why gain, why macerate something out of the grapes that afterwards you have to balance and fight and use gelatin to fine or who knows what. So I don't do any skin contact, keep it as light and you can see the color in this wine, how light it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's basically the, the, and also what's nice, we make a fair amount of rosé. We make, we made almost 24,000 cases of this wine. Um, so what we do is in order to able to pick at the perfect moment, that is, I think the key to make good rosé that you want to pick fresh. If you would only make a hundred percent Merlot rosé, I would have to pick all of these 24,000 cases in one week. Mm -hmm. And so by picking Cap Sauvignon, I can pick much later. I pick usually the Chardonnay first, the Merlot first. Merlot Chardonnay comes at the beginning. Certainly Cap Franc, Cap Sauvignon comes later. And then Riesling is usually my first. That comes basically from the, uh, the, the Pinot Noir comes from my sparkling wine production, which is the, the lees basically, the filtered lees that comes from sparkling wine, which works really well for a, a light rosé. So there's a, a purpose to this different grape varieties. Why you why you're choosing different grape varieties? So you can pick each one when it's when it's the right time. Uh, then we do make a blend. We make three different rosiers. Everybody has probably seen somewhere in a bottle, of course. Mm -hmm. That is our big flagship wine, or become a cult wine. Um, yeah. So that's the the reason why we use these different grape varieties. And we've always made the dry rosé starting in 1992. When at the time people would come to the tasting room, they made a somersault backwards because they wanted a sweet white zinfandel or something. And so we had a dry rosé. So it took a while that people realized that, you know, elegant rosés are something that one can be proud of. And so that has, has been taken off now. Um, yeah, so that's basically the, 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 the story behind our rosé that we make that we take it seriously. It's not like treated like a garbage can or oh, this Riesling didn't work out, throw it in the rosé, nobody will know, make it sweet or something. So making it dry, deliberately adding a certain amount of Riesling to add a bit of a pinch of acidity basically. So there's a lot of trials going on, uh, but it is a, a variety that works very, very consistent. We have made this wine since 1992 consistently of this quality. I think that's why we've gotten this following um, so I think it's certainly something. It's also maybe helping that, you know, you can still be a Montrachet lover and a Chateau Latour lover, but the local rosé is quite nice. So you don't lose faith uh, that you are a French urnophile, but you can support the local rosés. Or maybe this helped to break the ice or the prejudice. It's very hard to break prejudice, as you all know. And I think this wine helped to break the prejudice for, you know, for us here on Long Island for that people really fell in love with Long Island or New York wines, I should say. So if, so if Roman wasn't such a, uh, sorry to interrupt, if Roman wasn't such a humble individual, he would probably start name dropping all the people who love this wine, like Madonna, Billy Joel, Jay-Z. Beyonce uh, who, used it as her after 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 her tour as the after party wine, oh, which really? I volunteered to deliver it myself, but I was never taken up on it. <laughs> you came that close to being a Beyonce backup dancer, Roman. That's right. <laughs> but he, he also lives in 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 Rose neighborhood. I mean, it's a way of life in the Hamptons for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that is. I mean, it is once once summer starts, uh, that that's all they drink, and I love that. I mean, that's a and and. And they're drinking this right here. You know, this it, it's absolutely amazing what you guys have done at Wolfer in terms of uh, the One quality. thing that has also been very fortunate, it, it brings either I'm getting older or our customers getting younger, or both maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, that happens. <laughs> I mean, when you come to the taste room, it's full of young people. It is amazing. Like, and so the future, I think, looks very rosy, if I may make a pun. <laughs> that we are very fortunate to have young people. And as they graduate, 
into and you know and get better jobs and well let me try some red wine now and they will taste new york wine red wines and they will taste our red wine and and so there's a, a great future ahead when you have lots of young customers this is the winery we do have an immaculate vineyard i must say our vineyard manager is one of the best on the east coast richie pisacano we have so much detail into every vine every shoot every cluster positioning and we work with a lot of vineyards on the North Fork, where I always call it it's the mother-in-law comes to visit, you clean the house. So I, I make once a week visits to the North Fork vineyards um, so that everything looks in great shape. Um, the winery itself, you can also see how we expose the clusters. You see how the at the bottom, normally you wouldn't see any of those grape clusters there. They, they're still very young. It's early in July, I would say, end of July. Uh, but we expose 100% of the fruit very early right after flowering. And that's, I think, has been the trick for all of our red wine and rosé production that we don't get any of those pyrazines, those grassy green bell peppers and gooseberry flavors. So even that we pick sometimes at, you know, 11 and a half volume percent, 11 volume percent, I've picked Cap Sauvignon very, very, not early, but light. And there's no grassy and green flavors. So you're working just with fresh flavors and, and fruit, fruit forward characters. Uh, and rather than you know overripe grapes so that's i think shows the vineyard a little bit uh detailed vineyard and yeah does take a little bit of love to make good rosé but promise me that if justin bieber ever shows up you'll kick him out oh he has been there and he wore a big, oh, shirt, God. big shirt saying justin bieber on the back even which was i thought quite funny that you have Justin Bieber on your own name. Like, I mean, you wouldn't walk around where saying Peter Bell on your shirt, you know? Well, Peter Bell might. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Who cares? Or what was that funny state from Melania? <laughs> well, Roman, a question came in for you. Since you make two roses, someone is wondering how would you compare and contrast this with the summer in the bottle? What's the difference in style between the two roses? Actually, rosés? we make four different roses. Oh, four. Okay. Not counting the sparkling rose, sparkling wine rose, and the pink gin. But uh, well, the, this rose I pick first. This this gets the fresher, crisper, livelier, elegant characters. The summer in a bottle, we pick five to seven days later, where the pH comes up, the, the acidity comes down a bit, so there's a little bit more richness. I also add three percent gewürztraminer, or sometimes five percent gewürztraminer to the summer in a bottle to give you that fresh peach flavor, that fresh watermelon cantaloupe character. Summer in a bottle, you know why? Why does it have that name? Um, so it's the, so it has a bit of a bolder, still elegant, still vibrant, still you know really well balanced, but a little bit more giving, a bit more showy. Let's put it that way. So it, it fits the design of the bottle and. You know, so it, it's been, I mean, that's our flagship wine. We make 70,000 cases of summer in a bottle now. So it's, it, that has become our big staple. Uh, but I love the Estate Rosé. There's something about this light and this balance, this dancing on your tongue type of thing of a fresh light rosé. And like we have dancing on the tongue, romance under the stars. What, Dave, go ahead. 70,000 cases? Yes, uh, 71 actually, something like that. Oh, well, yeah, that extra thousand, that's important yeah. after the first 70. Yeah, that's great. That's not 72,000, I mean. Yeah, right, that would be out of control. For growth, come on. Well, so we we'll ask a question for Roman and then we're gonna go to Peter B. Kraft. So Roman, do you have a favorite pairing? With I your... do many, I mean, Rosé is so versatile. Lobster rolls, I mean, I mentioned earlier, the Bouya Bays is classic, you know, it's, <sighs> Stripe bass out here is I mean, actually for rosé. I wouldn't maybe let's say the lobster roll. I like it with beef carpaccio or like a beef tartare is a, a, f a fun wine to, to pair with. But the best thing is at Thanksgiving when everything is heavy and your marshmallows and whatever, and you want something light that cuts right through all that sweet and fat and, and whatever. And then later when the dinner is finished, you go to your Amarone or to your big, you know, big wine. So. Is there any Sri Lankan food that works with rosé? Because I, I'm, uh, you're married to a Sri Lankan. Yes, I'm married to a Sri Lankan wife, and uh, I go with Riesling. I have to say, when I serve Sri Lankan food, usually, uh, so I don't use the rosé. But the rosé would be nice, would be refreshing, you know, fresh, light, would be nice as well. But I think Riesling with five, seven, ten grams, fifteen grams of residual sugar is my preference with with curry. 
Love it. Yum. I'm getting hungry now. We've had so many good suggestions. So Peter B. Craft from Anthony Road Wine Company to Finger Lakes actually had the pleasure of visiting there maybe two or three years ago. So they're located along the upper western shores of Seneca Lake in the heart of the Finger Lakes. The vineyards were planted in 1973 and their philosophy is to produce excellent wines for the everyday enjoyment of life. And they come in and strong is Rosé of Limburger. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, and uh, you know to touch on that real quickly um, people that have been growing it here in the Finger Lakes for a long time uh, we've been you know growing it for uh, you know going on over two decades now um, call it Lemberger and if you're coming into it, if you're coming into it uh, a, a little bit later, in more recent times, uh, your introduction to that uh, grape was as Blau Frankish, okay. and so uh, that is that is sort of uh, that's how you can kind of decipher the differences there uh, for the most part. Um, the the ones that have been working with it for a long time still call it Lemberger because that's how we bought the grape, you know, the the uh, the vine to plant in the vineyard. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't uh, sold to us as Blau Frankish. It was Lemberger, and uh, and so uh, just because uh, it's hard to change your your child's name later in life, you know, because it's it's not fashionable. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Beulah, you're still <laughs> still Beulah. Yeah. You'll always be Beulah to us, you know. So how long have you been making the, the Lemberger Rosé? How many vintages have you made? Uh, Lemberger Rosé started uh, uh, more recently. Um, we've been making uh, a Rosé at Cabernet Franc since 2006. Uh, and the Lemberger Rosé started in 2014. At, at, on a smaller production, the, the main production is the, the Cabernet Franc Rosé. And uh, I, I wanted to um, uh, add some more colors to the, to the Cabernet Franc Rosé. And so we, we made a Lemberger Rosé, and I used that to help uh, blend into the Cab Franc to help support it, give it structure. Um, and, uh, but was very impressed with the results of the Lemberger as, as a, as a Rosé, as a wine. It, it, it's a great grape for the Finger Lakes. So is Cabernet Franc. Uh, here at Anthony Road, those are our two main red grapes. Uh, we make blends of those with reds, um, and Lemberger is, it's, it's great on its own, but it also plays well with others. And mm. so that's why I used it to blend with the Cabernet Franc. But on its own, and especially in this format as a Lemberger, um, uh, it's pretty enchanting. It's pretty fun to, to, uh, to make and also uh, drink. And uh, when, when I make rosé, um, uh, it's, it's a... a uh, soaking in the press, right? We pick it on the same day that we pick red wine. So I'm not picking it earlier. I, I do want to go for more um, uh, ripeness, uh, lower the acidity a bit. I'm not looking for tartness. Um, and uh, I'm looking for flavor. I'm also looking, I'm, I'm not afraid if there's a little bit more uh, alcohol in there. Um, that just helps support it to make it a, a, a little bit bigger. Um, uh, with this wine, there's stainless steel fermentation. Uh, there's also uh, neutral large format uh, uh, punch and barrel fermentations, and uh, and so there's there's multiple fermentations for this wine, and we just use those as colors to help sort of build it, um, uh, and uh, and then uh, the same with the Cabernet Franc rosé. Right, and I also noticed you know, the other rosés that we have are 2020. Yours is a 2019. Mm -hmm. So tell us about, you know, that, that extra aging time, um, you know, and someone, and you can all chime in on this. We often think of rosés like you have to drink them within that year, that they can't age, that they, you know, will just somehow fall apart. Um, sure. So I'd love to talk about your decision to, to give it a little more time. Sure. Well, um, there, there, there are a lot of factors. One, um, we uh, didn't sell out of it yet, so uh, there you go, right? <laughs> Uh, two, uh, the uh, the gray label uh, at Anthony Road is uh, is a smaller label. It gives me a smaller label within a bigger label, right? So we can we can hold on to these. We can give these a bit more um, uh, time in the bottle before release, uh, and that that's essentially uh, the case with this. 
um, it, it is, it is uh, uh, sold out now, and, and now I'm waiting for capsules from Germany um, to come before I can get the new one in bottle. Um, that, otherwise, you probably would have had the 2020. But uh, these, it, it goes to show that, um, uh, you know, this is just a year in bottle. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of our rosés, honestly, are only reaching, like, uh, uh, coming into their own when they're completely sold out. Um, it is, it is a, a, an early consumption wine, and, and that's fine because it, it is a super fresh expression of red grapes and, a, and, and sort of a, a hybrid kind of a, a mix between a white and a red style. Um, but, uh, but the red can, uh, you know, it is a wine it's, it, that, that can age a bit. This is just a year. This is hardly aging, you know. Uh, I didn't present to one that's five years old. Um, uh, and if I did, uh, sure, it, it would be uh, the, the flavors would be more evolved. There may be a little bit more of a oxidative kind of fruit. Uh, the freshness of the fruit is now, um, you know, not as fresh picked as, 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 uh, as it is in all of these styles. Um, so uh, you shouldn't be afraid uh, if, there's, if there's a rosé out there that isn't of the vintage. There's a lot of misconceptions uh, in the marketplace about rosés, one that it, it, it can only, you should only drink it in the summer. That's nonsense. Rosé, rosé, all of these wines, rosé in general is probably the most versatile food wine that there is. Uh, it goes with everything. Uh, and, and it goes with every occasion, um, it, all the way up to Thanksgiving, all the way up to Christmas, all the way up and, and, and through those cold months. Um, uh, I don't stop drinking white wine during the winter, and I definitely don't stop drinking rosé. Uh, it, 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 it is that go-to. It's great on its own, right? You know, uh, in terms of pairing it with something, you can pair it with your couch and Netflix, right? You can, uh, you know, you can also, um, you know, pair it with, uh, uh, you know, you can pair it with anything on the grill outside. Um, seafood, I, I love. My epiphany moment was in uh, a restaurant in New York City. Uh, it was just a, a nice uh, fennel salad with uh, with some uh, mozzarella, fresh mozzarella, and uh, a light uh, a light uh, uh, vinegar on it and, and olive oil. Boom! It was it was it, it, with with a with the rosé from from um, from Barolo, and and it was uh, absolutely uh, that was my transcendent moment. Um, and so, but most of the times I'm, I'm force pairing, like most everybody, mm -hmm. you know, and that is what are we eating and what do we have open, right? Or, you know, and, and, and most of us, and that's how you discover, you know, I'm, I'm a winemaker, I'm not a song. You know, it's not my job to do that. It's my job to make the wine and, and, uh, and also to uh, make sure that it's tasty enough that you're going to drink it. What does the gray line symbolize? Is there any, or is it art or is it something with the vineyard or the land? The gray lines? Yeah. Um, on the, on the um, uh, Roman, I'm, I'm shocked you're not familiar with our regular labels, but you know, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, do, we'll, do a, we'll do a trade, we'll do an exchange. Um, so uh, the gray lines, uh, this is just a sort of an abstract um, that, that is, when, when you're wondering what it is, the answer is yes, because it's an abstraction that, uh, that refers to things. Uh, and, and so you bring your own, your own uh, reference into it, and, and that, if, if you're thinking about it, then, then it's working. I'm going to here. Uh, Wanda, do you mind? By no, please, go ahead, please. Uh, you and I we just start talking at the same time. And <laughs> Us anthropology <laughs> majors. I don't want to prevail, but what Beecraft said is very interesting because often we're on uh, in under great pressure to bottle a, a, a rosé and release it, say by this time, like March, April, January, and that sounds like a good idea, but it's actually not because there is this phenomenon called bottle shock. And scientists don't really still don't know what that's all about, but a wine's uh, aromas and mouth flavors do shut down for a couple months, even longer. And that, you know, be, is something that befalls 
freshly bottled rosé is probably more than any other thing. So it's a great idea to give them, you know, a pass until September, October, or even to the, into the next year. We can't do that because of the demand, which is great, but we wish we could do that. No, it's true. You know, we're going to wrap up soon, but definitely, I'm sure you're all feeling this, the pressure to be more productive each vintage with the rosé because there is such demand for it. But are you kind of experimenting um, with aging? Are you holding some back to see how rosé will age with the hope that maybe people will start to seek that out? Anyone want to talk about aging rosé that maybe they're experimenting with? Well, you, you have to make a wine that has aging potential, you know, and so you, you can make a rosé with more power, with more layers, more texture. We make a, a reserve rosé, it's called Grandioso, it's a white horse wine that's barrel fermented, but in old neutral barrels, but it has, it stays five months to leave with batonnage, with the stirring of the leaves, so you're really adding a lot of texture, and that wine ages three, four years without any problem, and actually gets nicer after two, two years, so you but the regular rosés that are fresh and elegant, you know, I, I'm an advocate, drink them fresh and elegant, light, early. Anyone else? Yeah, I I would, say, if, uh, if you're not doing it already, I would hope that you put you put uh, wines away in a library so you can come back to this. Uh, it is is it a is it a great e idea? Well, you have to find out in your own situation. Um, and, uh, but they can be, uh, they can be different and, uh, and still valid expressions of, of the style. Yeah. And if we use France as a reference, um, for the longest time, Tavel wines, for instance, were quite quickly oxidative. So they became kind of orangey colored and to a technical palate, somewhat aldehydic. And they were still enjoyed, but they didn't enjoy much much of a market share until we figured out they figured out that preserving freshness and fruit driven kind of capacity was the way to go. So it's a paradigm shift. Um, the, the 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 quality of these wines today is just so goddamn high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the fact that y'all touched on how hard it is to make rosé. I think there is this misconception. Oh, it's easy. They turn it out every summer and there it goes. So I'm glad you all spoke to the craftsmanship, how meticulous you have to be is such an important point. Yeah, so this is a wrap wide up soon. so many no, things go ahead, going on with this. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Where uh, are we going to so, so many things can go wrong mm -hmm. with rosé when you're making it and you know you can over skin contact it or under skin contact it you can pick it at the wrong time um, it really wants to get stinky if you're not really vigilant um, it's like smelly sulfitic it wants to stick i.e the residual sugar which is not a great idea it wants to undergo a spontaneous malolactic fermentation and we're beginning to understand why that is um, so unless you embrace that, you have to take steps to not let that happen. And it's also very, very kind of naked. If you do put it in barrels, it's going to say, ha ha, I've been in barrels. Ha ha, look at me. And you don't really want that. You want some kind of like. So it's like the just, it's the Justin Bieber effect. It's like showing up with your name on your, <laughs> look at me. Yeah. I I, why am I beating up on that kid? I don't even know who he is, really. I don't know his music, but anyway. Okay. It's already right. Canadian. Don't Go be ahead, a He's Roman's friend. <laughs> I want to give you all 15 seconds. We're going to wrap up. If there's something that you just really want to get out before we say goodbye, I'm going to start with Dave Breeden. Any final thoughts that you want to share, Dave? Drink rosé. Perfect. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Well, Bruce, anything you want to say? Oh, Bruce, sorry. Yeah, just a pleasure to be here today and, and to have you get to sample my wines. Great. Roman? I love doing blind tastings. We do, we do them every year because everybody wants to know how good our rosé is against the best, you know, the most famous rosés from the world. And we all, luckily, we always fare very well. So that's the best fun. Have six, seven friends. Each one bring a bottle of rosé, wrap them, taste them blind judge them which is your favorite 
and see what happens in New York rocks. <laughs> Great. Peter Bell? It's such a thrill to, to see that this wine stock, the category has been, has become so central to everybody's drinking um, style because 25 years ago, it was an outlier and now it's, it's not gonna go away. It's not, it's not a trendy wine, it's there. It's here for good. And Wanda, thank you so much. You're so good at this. Oh, thank you, Peter. And last yeah. but not least, <laughs> Peter B. Kraft. We gotta give him his 15 sure. seconds. <laughs> thanks, Wanda, I wanna thank you very much. And um, my wife thanks everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to thank you, you lovely gentlemen of Rosé. Thank you for being here, sharing the romance, the charms, the power, the science, the philosophy of Rosé. So all of you out there, thanks for joining us. I know you have a lot of Rosé wines to choose from, but support our New York winemakers because the wines are good. They're interesting. They're unique. They have character. They're New York wines. They have it all. So really, I hope you've enjoyed it. You can go to buynewyorkwines.com if you want to get these wines. And thank you all. Have a wonderful spring and summer season. Stay safe. Thank you all. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. Along. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Wanda. Thanks to all of you for attending and to our panelists, uh, Dave, Bruce, our two Peters, Bell and Beecraft, and Roman for a terrific session. As a reminder, we hope you will join us for our next upcoming event in this varietal series, which occurs on Tuesday, June 8th at 11 a.m. with Riesling, the noble one with Paul Rico. Thank you and have a great rest of your evening. <laughs>